The Carnegie Mellon Vaccination Database Talks are made possible by Ottitune. Learn how to automatically optimise your MySQL and Postgres configurations at ottitune.com. And by the Stephen Moy Foundation for keeping it real. Find out how best to keep it real at stephenmoyfoundation.org. Hi guys, welcome to the last talk in our Vaccination Database Seminar series. Uh, we're very, very excited today to finish off the semester with Benjamin Wagner. Uh, he is a uh, the lead of the query processing team at Firebolt. He's also a uh, alumni of Thomas Neumann and the famous database group at TU Munich, um, where he's he's currently located now. Um, so as always, if you have any questions for Benjamin as he gives this talk, please unmute yourself and say who you are, and feel free to ask questions anytime. We want this talk to be interactive. Um, and with that, Benjamin, thank you for, thank you so much for being here. The shirt is awesome. The floor is yours. Go for it. Perfect, Andy, we'll get you a shirt. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for having us. Uh, thanks for the intro. We're, we're super excited to be here and finally like be able to actually drill down, uh, go in depth on how we're building Firebolt. Um, right, so yeah, I'm Benjamin, team lead for the query processing team, right? As Andy said, any questions coming up, please interrupt me, I'm sure Andy will. Uh, so feel, feel free to join in. Um, good. So before we get started, um, I want to give you a quick outline of the overall talk and kind of get you ready for what to expect. So um, basically, when we go out of this talk, uh, I want you all to know, OK, how do we think that data warehousing is changing? And basically, if you decided to build a cloud data warehouse today, uh, what are the architectural choices you would have to make? Uh, which kind of, kind of crossing points would you have along the way? And what are maybe interesting choices? And yeah, just, just where can you go in general? So without further ado, let's jump right in. And before we move ahead and actually talk about Firebolt, I just want to take a step back and really say that it's been an amazing decade for cloud analytics as a whole. So here we see kind of four of the biggest cloud data platforms out there right now. Um, and all of them right, came out in the last 10 to 12 years. Um, and really changed the landscape, innovated a lot, and kind of pushed the space to where it is today. At the bottom left, we have Redshift, which was, of course, one of the first kind of database as a service offerings on AWS. Uh, so pushing this onto AWS, the biggest cloud vendor. Databricks really showed like the world just how distributed high performance data crunching is possible. Um, Snowflake innovated a lot when it comes to decoupled storage and compute, right? Uh, kind of isolation of workloads through different warehouses. And finally, Google BigQuery um, kind of changed the game when it comes to the pricing model, right? They're kind of abstracting away from the actual resources and giving you a more serverless type of offering. And thanks to all of these great products, um, nowadays, cloud data warehouses have become really commonplace across a massive variety of workloads. So this includes things like ELT, ETL, ML, ad hoc query, BI, reporting, and so on. And one of the amazing things is that then over the past years, there was kind of this push back to SQL, uh, which, which is amazing. And so now you have this super wide ecosystem around SQL as a common language, right? Your kind of ELT, ETL, or transformation tools like uh, Fivetran, DBT, those speak SQL. At the same time, your actually visualization tools like Tableau, Superset, or Looker also speak SQL. And going back, this just allows a data warehouse to be used in tons of different contexts across a wide variety of workloads. What we're seeing at Firebolt though, and this is where we're starting to kind of get, get into the details of the talk, is that more and more companies are collecting massive amounts of data and actually want to build a new type of workload or use a new type of workload in increasing fashion. And these are customer facing data applications. What does that mean? So I'm giving you this term. I want to give you an example. Say, I hope some of you are gamers, uh, you build an RPG, right? Kind of an online role-playing game. And you have players running around your map, interacting, trading, talking to each other. There's a good chance you're generating massive amounts of data, different types of events, and then ingesting them into some data pipeline, backing it up to either S3, data warehouse, or something custom built. And then you actually want to use all this data and re-expose it back to your players. So you might want to show them a dashboard saying, okay, with these types of items, that's how your trades improve, or uh, kind of this is where you're doing especially well on the map, or these are the players you're interacting most, most with. 
And if you're the gaming company building this RPG now, this is super important for you, right? Like this is driving revenue directly because it helps you to retain players. It helps you kind of help players dig into their data. Um, and all of you who have played games before probably know uh, that this is actually quite fun to do. And these types of workloads where you're collecting insane amounts of data and then want to kind of re-expose it uh, back to your customers as a company is gaining more and more popularity across a wide variety of different sectors, right? That's not just game tech. There's also things like ad tech, fintech, um, and so on. And currently, very often, uh, these companies build their own data pipelines to be able to run these types of workloads because they have pretty hard workload requirements. But going back to the second bullet point here, kind of our claim is that wouldn't, be, wouldn't it be amazing to actually be also able to run these types of customer facing data applications on top of your data warehouse? Um, why? Well, you don't need to retain like two data pipelines. There's a good chance you're backing up all your data into your warehouse anyways. And then having this wide ecosystem, SQL as a language, which a lot of people are able to write is actually super useful. However, these workloads are actually pretty challenging for data warehouses at the moment because they require low latency. Uh, you don't want your users to wait kind of three seconds for your dashboard to load on how you've been doing. They require predictable latency. In your RPG example, you don't want to have the dashboard loading in 200 seconds at night and then during the day, during peak hours, in two seconds. And tying into this, the final thing is uh, you also have high QPS, so queries per second, and just in general, high concurrency, which is also pretty challenging in this setting uh, because you might have thousands of players at the same time looking at dashboards. And so all of this makes it a very challenging workload. And that's actually where Fireball comes in. And that's currently the workload kind of we're trying to excel at and really be able to provide these low latency data intensive applications. While at the same time, also solving these more traditional types of workloads along ELT, ETL, batch, and so on. So um, before we drill into the technical details, uh, the RPG example is nice because it's very visual. I do want to give you a real world example of Similar Web, one of our customers. They are a market intelligence company collecting information about 100 million websites. And in total, they have more than 200 terabytes stored in Firebolt. And what they're then doing is they're using this data to expose it back to the users and give them information and kind of analytics interfaces into things like audience loyalty and so on. So this is an ad tech real world example, um, which I think kind of illustrates this nicely. And by using a data warehouse for these types of things, building new use cases, building new kind of visualizations and so on is actually quite simple. Good, let's start digging in. This is probably the th time where things get more interesting for most of you. So this is Firewall at 10,000 feet. And over the top, we'll drill down into each of these layers. At the very top, you have your like overall REST APIs, JDBC connector, data science connectors, BI tools, and so on. And these all talk SQL to some service endpoint we're providing. And in a cloud data warehouse, uh, you then have the service layer containing things like administration, security, billing, metadata, and so on. And then below that, you have the actual compute part of the system. And this is where things get really interesting for most of you probably. So Firebolt, builds up on decoupled storage and compute. This means that all our data is actually stored like durably on AWS S3 in our custom file format called FFF. And then we have tons of sparse indexes, materialized view, et cetera, which are also stored on there. And then our unit of computations are so-called engines. And an engine is a cluster of nodes between one and 128. Uh, and these then kind of serve as a SQL endpoint and are able to execute a single query concurrently. So one query can run on all nodes within an engine. And here we can nicely see that these engines provide resource isolation. So you might have one engine running for ingestion, which reads external data from Parquet, Org, JSON, something like that, writes it to S3. And then the other engines will start seeing these files, loading them into your caches um, and be able to actually run queries on them. And by, for example, running one engine for reporting, and one for customer facing dashboards, you can make sure that the data engineer running a massive kind of batch job is not going to slow down your customer facing dashboards. Good. So let's now drill down into each of these layers. And if you're building a modern cloud data warehouse, 
you actually kind of need to start off with a high performance engine as a baseline. And for us here, really, uh, the kind of important thing was we wanted to build up on the modern distributed high performance engine. And in this world, you really have two choices. Either you build from scratch, which is, for example, what Snowflake did, or you decide to fork your actual runtime from an open source engine. And so this is indeed what we did. Our baseline for the runtime is actually ClickHouse. And ClickHouse, at this point, we just want to give a huge shout out, right, to all the open source contributors, people working at Yandex or now ClickHouse Inc., um, building the system, making it available to the public. And really, for us, this choice was a no brainer. ClickHouse arguably is the fastest distributed open source system out there. And kind of the overall traction it has in the open source community, um, really around the globe, so also in China, for example, uh, really is a huge testament to that. Let me give you a quick one-on-one -on, -one on ClickHouse before we talk about how we're kind of moving ahead with that as a baseline. So this is a hard fork, right? This is not you trying to maintain your own distribution. of exactly. yes. we'll, okay. we'll get more into this. This is a hard fork. And we'll okay. kind of show you where we like really move the way. So okay. ClickHouse is an open source, high performance OLAP database system, which was originally developed by Yandex um, and now actually spun out as ClickHouse Inc. So congrats on that. And it's a vectorized column store with distributed pro processing capabilities. And those of you who are into ClickHouse will actually know it's not just vectorized, it has also some elements of just-in-time compilation sprinkled in. For example, like for expression evaluation, certain types of aggregations, um, and so on. Exactly. So, and distributed processing capabilities are kind of a must in the space we're in because if you have, yeah, like dozens or hundreds of terabytes of data, just scaling up on a single node simply doesn't cut it. ClickHouse is a great starting point as a high performance runtime. But ultimately, for Firebolt, that's what ClickHouse is our high performance runtime. And sure, this is an important part of a cloud data warehouse, but you also have to solve a lot of different challenges. So, this is decoupled storage and compute, a metadata layer, query planning, then like support for these very, very complex data warehousing queries. You have to build a service layer, an orchestration layer to make it a real cloud service. And then you have to integrate with the ecosystem. And so all of these are things we're touching at the moment at Firebolt. And in the remainder of the talk, I actually want to go in depth on all of them and just show you how we're building them and what we're doing in these spaces. Let's get started with the couple storage and compute. Going back to our early architecture diagram, uh, we have marked kind of in red which parts these are. So this is on the one hand, the actual storage layer in S3, so our file format, uh, indexes, etc. And then also the local caches on the different engines, because you don't want to run, of course, from S3 if you need to do low latency queries. And before we drill in to our actual like decoupled storage and compute layer, I want to quickly talk about the merge tree of ClickHouse, which is the backing storage engine within ClickHouse and actually the most stable one used there. Good. So in this example, we're creating a table customers with four columns, date, user ID, some user balance, and some string column for a browser and browser version. And then ClickHouse allows you to do things, two things at the merge tree. A, it allows you to partition. In our case, we partition by month. And B, it has this concept of like a primary index, in this case, ID, and we'll get to this in a second. So now we're ingesting these rows here to the left. These are from March and one from April. ClickHouse within the merge tree will now sort and partition this data. To the right here, we're, for example, able to see one file within the backing March partition. We can see the April row is, of course, not a part of this. And then within, these fi within this file of the overall March partition, we can see that the file internally is actually sorted by ID, so this primary index. And these can be multiple columns and expression and so on. And so why is it called merge tree, maybe? Uh, because one partition can have multiple files and ClickHouse in the background, a bit similar to an LSM, actually compacts these uh, over time and builds larger and larger runs of data. The second thing ClickHouse's merge tree has, which is amazing, is support for sparse indexing. So let's take again our one file on the left here and see how ClickHouse actually builds sparse indexes on top of that. Um, in this case, ClickHouse will split the file internally into smaller blocks, which are also called ranges. In our case, these are blocks of two rows. So, and then 
for each of these blocks or ranges, you can start building kind of one granule for your sparse index. At the bottom, this is maybe a well-known one, you have a small materialized aggregate or a min-max index on balance. And now if you have a query like, uh, query like balance smaller than, I don't know, 250, you would be able to exclude the second range in this case. But you also can, for example, build bloom filters, which are great for high cardinality string columns. If you, for example, now have an equality lookup on the browser and a version, or you can build a sparse primary index, which utilizes kind of the order of data in order to also be able to provide pruning. So in this case here, the sparse primary index on ID would say, okay, the first row in the first block has value 12, the first row in the second block has 56, and the first value in the third block has 171. And then if we have kind of a range predicate on ID, we could also use this for pruning. And um, exactly, our file format, triple F, is actually based on ClickHouse's merge tree. Um, and however, the merge tree was built originally to store data durably either on SSDs or HDDs, so locally attached disks. And for us, we really kind of ripped out large parts of the storage layer and made sure the data is stored durably on S3. And then we built a multi-tier buffer manager on top of that to be able to retain data locality. And multi-tier really means that the, the storage hierarchy in the cloud is just getting insanely deep, right? If you're building a single node database, you already have a pretty deep hierarchy. You're thinking about caches, main memory, uh, kind of your CPU reg registers at the top, of course, and then also like local disks, so SSDs or maybe rotating hard drives. In the cloud, you have on top of that kind of EFS, for example, a distributed file system. So we're running exclusively on AWS. So that's why I'll talk about their offerings for now. And then of course you have S3 at the very bottom. And as I said before, you really don't always want to go to S3. So in production, pretty often, we're actually seeing S3 at access latencies of a few dozen milliseconds. And if you want to build interactive dashboards, that's just unacceptable. And so our buffer manager uses both local SSDs and EFS and then S3 to basically keep data as close to the actual compute as possible. And another thing that's important here is that our buffer manager actually doesn't really operate at file granularity. So we said before that ClickHouse merge tree takes these kind of builds these files and internally splits them into ranges. And these ranges are actually the granularity of our buffer manager. This means that we actually have a buffer manager which kind of works on offsets within files and is able to only cache subsets of certain files. And for us, these blocks, so these kind of minimal ranges we're able to access, usually have, I don't know, a few 10,000 rows in them. So this is really extremely fine granular. And then for each of these 10,000 rows, for example, or 20, 30,000, we'll store one of these index granules. At first glance, this might seem kind of excessive, and it's definitely a lot more fine granular than some other players uh, are doing. However, we're actually seeing that it works well and that our index sizes are not becoming excessive because even if it's only like every 10,000 rows, you will usually have like index overhead, maybe in the order of 0.1% or even less. So even if you have terabytes of data, your actually indexes will only contain, have a few gigabytes. And then of course you can split these across the nodes in the cluster. Okay. The point about sure. the buffer, your, your buffer manager, it doesn't, uh -huh. doesn't operate in blocks, so you're operating in ranges, but like, you're basically saying that like there's like instead of tracking like I have page one, page two, page three, you're basically mm -hmm. saying I have this range in, but of course that range maps to a file anyway. Um, yes, so, so this some... range maps to a backing file. That's correct. But so okay. kind of the like buffer manager is sparse over these files. Uh, okay, okay. So, I'll give so you an example. In... Like I have a visualization in a second, so then we'll kind okay. of be able to dig in. Um, good. And so our kind of the coupled storage and compute layer is of course also heavily tied to our like central metadata service. And we'll go more in depth on a second. And this is super important for like transactional consistency and making kind of updates and inserts visible across the different engines. And so we're not is just working okay with buffer to, managers. I'm sorry, oh. is it okay to ask questions right now or? Yes, okay. Yeah, yeah, this is Steven. Awesome. And I have a question regarding your sure. metadata service. What is the, 
system that store your metadata surface. We know Snowflake uses FDB. So for yes. you, how do you store your metadata? I'll also answer that question later. So I'll really give you the rundown of the whole stack. Um, perfect. So uh, let's keep this for later, Stephen. Um, on top of that, we're also extending the file format, actually, uh, working on kind of new index types and compression codecs. And here we really like want to stay up to date with recent research. So for example, currently we're investigating actually FSST by Bonsch, uh, Lysa Neumann at VLDB 2020 as a compression codec for strings. And then we're also implementing the Kupu index uh, by Kip Foley was at Google, uh, also published at VLDB 2020. And the Kupu index is pretty neat uh, for kind of cloud data warehouses, um, especially if you have like many of these ranges because internally it kind of for medium cardinality uh, columns, it will save you a lot of space because instead of building, for example, a bloom filter on every block, it builds a cuckoo hash table and then maps to like fingerprints or certain bit vectors. So I encourage everyone to look at that paper. It's, it's a very nice read. We have, we have another uh, byte level encoding scheme, compression scheme in Sigma last year you should look at as well. Nice, awesome, thank you. I'll send, I'll send a link. Good, so let's get to the example for how- Wait, to, has, Hamid, Hamid has a question. Sure. Hamid, you wanna meet, uh, meet yourself? Yeah, so I should do two things. So who is managing the... Uh, I think you cut off. Yeah, you cut off. Okay, so can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so who is managing the cache in the clusters? And the second piece of that, is that the read on the cache or it is a read write cache? Right, so great question. Um, who is managing the cache? Well, we are, and we're trying to manage it in a smart way in order to be able to keep the law, like hot data in our local caches. So we'll get to this in a second, but the user, if that's what you're asking, has like no influence on caching. We're doing this completely transparently. Um, the second question of whether it's like a read cache or a read write cache, um, well, mostly it's a read cache, right? Because if you're actually updating or writing data, you always have to write through directly uh, to S3 in order to make the changes visible to the other engines. So. I hope that answers the question. Otherwise, we can of course drill down later in the Q and A. Here we're able okay, to. So that will that will slow down your ingest particularly because you have to wait until the optic store uh, acknowledges that you, you got the data. Yes, um, definitely. But in other cases, it's going to be extremely hard to be consistent, right? Because if your kind of node crashes before you wrote things to S three, it's actually going to be lost because this is like ephemeral data. Yeah, that's because you're not doing any logging. Right, yeah. So this is like uh, another big topic. Uh, I would say if, if we want to have like a longer discussion, let's move it towards the end of the talk um, because I would be of course happy to talk about that. Perfect. Uh, so here in our storage layer on S3, we're storing things in this triple F format. We can see that we have two files which are internally divided into these five ranges each. And each file attached has sparse indexes. So these are really at file granularity. When we start up the engine, we load all these sparse indexes into our local SSD caches. This is important because the access to the indices has to be fast because these are later used for pruning. So now a SQL query enters the system. SQL query is parsed, turned into a logical query plan, repeatedly optimized, turned into a physical plan. And once we have the physical plan, we have our table scan nodes and attached predicates uh, and we can really start asking the question, okay, which data do I need? So what do we do? We look up our sparse indexes based on these predicates. And in this case, identify that, okay, from file A, we run a read range A.2. And from file B, we want to read range B.4. Pretty often in production, one of the most useful indexes for us is actually this kind of sparse primary index using ordering of data. Now, we can load these into our local SSD caches and then actually execute the query. So I'll talk more about this in a second. Uh, bear with me for a moment. And now, of course, if the query gets kind of sent in again and we didn't evict anything from our cache, we'll be able to, in the next time, do this pruning run again with these sparse indexes, but see that data is actually cached locally and then just execute on these ranges directly. Um, so. This is actually a bit of a simplified view and this works nicely for a single table. However, it's not like a two-step process where we first load all the data onto our cache and then actually do the execution. 
this would be wasteful. Say you have something like select star from a huge table, limit 100. Um, you actually want to do this in a pipeline fashion. So as we're executing the table scan, we're kind of reading things. And then if we're kind of feeding it pipeline into the execution pipeline uh, to be able to, in many cases, terminate early. Good. And did this answer your earlier question on kind of uh, how the buffer manager doesn't work like for full files, but actually only fetches ranges. So maybe to give a bit of context here, um, in a sense, then this range becomes like your minimally accessible block, right? These are usually heavily compressed um, and these have to be like loaded in total because if you don't have like a random access compression format, you actually need to decompress the whole range in order to read. I said that, yeah. Perfect. So what's the size of the block that you bring in? Yeah, so um, as I said before, uh, kind of in one of these ranges, you'll have usually a few 10,000 rows. And then it's a column store as well. So you actually only read kind of the columns from the ranges that you actually need. So, right, let's say, okay, eight byte integers. Um, in that case, what you have like a few hundred kilobytes or something. Um, but these will usually be heavily compressed as well, if possible. So the actual like S3 reads for a certain range will be smaller. Um, but then of course you like very often you actually access consecutive ranges because for example, you are interested in a certain range based on your sort key. And then you can do actually like larger reads on S3. But in principle, if you have like really like queries accessing tiny amounts of data, you can narrow this down very aggressively. And this then ties back into what I said earlier of how we want to like be very, very good at these types of low latency workloads. Um, this is kind of a hard requirement because if you have to scan excessive amounts of data, no matter how fast your engine is, you're just like going to hit limits at some point of your like network throughput and so on, on how fast you can execute a query. And to be clear, this, this is like this, the bubble hole is, this is, ClickHouse doesn't have this. This is, this is what you guys have added. Yes, this is built like totally on top uh, of that. So like this kind of multi-tier buffer manager using different layers, this is um, completely built by Fireball. Yeah. I have a question in sure. terms of the MVCC and also we didn't really talk about whether multiple cluster can actually write into the storage, but I'm very interested in what happened in terms of MVCC when the data on S3 changes that impact your caches. Right, I mean, so that's a great question. Um, and in general, um, what might happen is that you start getting cache misses, right? But if you kind of interface with your metadata layer in a smart way um, and build something like snapshot isolation into this, and for context, we're not 100% there yet, but we're working like very hard, uh, and I'll get more in depth on that on the metadata layer, you would kind of get your transaction timestamp, then fetch from metadata the files you need to access, uh, push these down into your table scans, and then, okay, uh, if like you got new files in the meantime, which were kind of written by some other engine doing ingestion, uh, you would just have to fetch them from S3. Does that answer the question? Yes, thank you. Perfect. Good. So let's go on, drill down into the metadata layer. I love that there's so many questions. Um, good. Um, so metadata um, is here at the top in this case, uh, but in our opinion, actually kind of metadata might be the most important thing to get right in the cloud data warehouse. And first off, what is metadata? And really everything in a sense that's not table data, so data stored by the user in the warehouse is metadata. So this includes SQL objects like tables, views, and so on. It contains things like user accounts, security policies, roles, roles, which are important for user management and kind of access control. It's also responsible for transaction management, right? It has this information on which files there are and which versions are currently active, for example. And all of this has to be handled by the metadata service. And at the same time, some of the hard challenges you're seeing here um, are that there's like not just this wide variety of data, but also a massive variety of use cases, right? For every query, there are certain calls to metadata, fetching timestamp or reading certain parts or certain files from disk. At the same time, you have, for example, maybe some billing service which wants to subscribe asynchronously to certain events happening in the metadata service. And then you might on top store something like optimizer statistics in there to be able to do proper cardinality estimation. Um, and all these things together kind of give you this massive variety of use cases um, and also different kind of just 
uh, data structures and different data use cases, which all have to be supported by this layer. Our current metadata layer is actually built on FoundationDB uh, in most parts. And yeah, uh, so kind of the lesson learned here is that building this is actually extremely hard. And it's going to be a huge engineering focus for us in 2022. Um, because you also have things like, for example, like multi-tenancy and isolation, which have to be supported by this, right? If one user starts sending tons of queries and you have this one global or regional metadata service, you don't want other queries from other users to be slowed down in their metadata requests in a sense. Uh, and you have to kind of be able to do workload isolation here and so on. And these are actually hard questions. Maybe next year uh, we can come back and talk just about these challenges. Um, good. I think well, like, the, the language you're using kind of sounds like you're using foundation DB now, but it's a temporary solution and you're going to re replace it or. Right. It, it, so we're, we're using foundation DB now. Um, and I think kind of for a while, it's going to stay that way, but definitely like, I mean, no one said you have to use foundation DB for these types of workloads. Right. So we're always kind of investigating which other options there might be. Um, but I am not like I'm not the metadata expert at Firebolt, uh, so I won't be able to like go super in depth uh, on your like super detailed questions on that. No, that's fine. It, it, it would, but again, it, it sounded like it was a temporary solution. I just want to make make it make understand what you're actually trying to say. Right. This clarifies. Right. Thank you. Good. Um, I've got a follow up question on sure. the metadata, and is that uh, so? Um, I don't know if you talk, actually talked about, I think in Fireball is your customer bring their AWS um, credential in. So the processing power is actually using the customer AWS account. I want to understand for the metadata, is it the same? Do you launch the metadata layer in your customer or is it multi-tenant in your, in your own AWS account? Okay, so, I mean, there's two things here. A, the actual compute of the engines um, it's also running kind of in our like AWS, I don't know, like uh, namespace in a sense, like these are our clusters in a sense. However, to be able to like ingest data from S3, you of course like need to be able to access uh, the actual like data stored on customer buckets. So like this is the only part where we actually interface with the outside world. And then like all the ingestion computation is actually done within Firebolt. Got it, thank you. Perfect. Oh, um, maybe. The, the second part of the question is, is it sure. a multi-tenant metadata surface or is a per foundation DB per customer? Yes, so great question. And this ties into like the isolation things I talked about. So it's multi-tenant um, and this kind of is one of the things that makes it hard because you have to make sure that just like different workloads coming from different customers don't interfere with each other and slow each other down. Thank you. Sure. I, we have a question in the chat from Karen. Uh, if you have... Uh -huh. You want to know why you're moving off the foundation to be uh, for the metadata layer? Excuse me? Do you want to know why you, you're, you guys are deciding to get off a of foundation to be or considering getting off a of foundation to be for your well, metadata I mean, layer? We, we're not like, nothing is considered in this case at the current thing. I mean, foundation DB is a great kind of key value store and it's used very successfully for like these types of metadata services, right? It's like available, it's distributed, it's super scalable. Um, so we're like definitely happy with foundation DB. I didn't want to say we're definitely moving off of it. Um, not at all. It's just kind of, if you're, if you're in this space, I think you have to be open to like at any time considering alternatives and just seeing what's out there. And that's something we're trying to do. Um, another way to ask what maybe what she's asking is what are the problems they're facing with foundation DB that would cause you to consider right now to consider something else? Right. I mean, again, like kind of, I'm not the huge expert on kind of metadata at Firebolt. So I'm actually not the perfect like person to answer this. I would be happy, like shoot me an email and I would be happy to put you in contact with the people and you can like ask this. Uh, but I just like at the current time, like don't have a perfect answer for that. Fair. Okay, awesome, thanks. Perfect, thanks. Good. Uh, so next thing, the actual query engine. So this is where I hopefully can answer all the questions coming up. Um, query engine has actually two parts, right, uh, in our case. And the first one is the query planner. And here, we decided to really completely replace the ClickHouse parsing and optimization layer. Um, this is because ClickHouse um, actually has a custom SQL dialect um, and also not a huge amount of optimizations within their optimizer. And what we really wanted to have, and this was a hard requirement in a sense, is first off, have a SQL dialect 
which is as close as possible in a sense to the Postgres dialect. This is important A, for integrating properly with the ecosystem um, and B, it's important for actually like ease of use and adoption because customers like will usually have used Postgres and be familiar with that syntax. The second thing we really needed is a powerful query planner. And this is really like a, a no brainer in a sense for a cloud data warehouse, because usually the people writing queries will not be kind of huge domain experts deeply into databases. And pretty often queries will actually be auto generated by some type of application. And in that case, there's a good chance, for example, like join order specified in the SQL query actually doesn't match, for example, the smart join order that you actually want to execute. Our optimizer originally forked off high rise and I saw some of the high rise folks. So like Marcus uh, in here earlier. So huge shout out to them um, for building kind of an academic system at Hasselblad Institute in Potsdam close to Berlin, also Germany. And high rise is like a very neat kind of standalone single node academic database system. It has its own SQL parser and um, then kind of an optimizer and also a whole execution layer. And we took this optimization layer and the parsing layer and turn it into like a standalone kind of embedded optimizer library. Um, for this, we had to mix up quite a few things. So the first thing is we had to heavily extend the parser to actually be like closer to Postgres, which we talked about before. And the second thing is that kind of, we put high-rise, as I said, as an embedded service into our actual like stateless compute clusters. Uh, so the things running kind of the ClickHouse engine as a runtime. And this is interesting. Uh, because we then don't have like a custom parsing and planning service at the top, which routes th certain things to like the compute clusters, but rather this is embedded. Um, and this is a choice we made, again, because of this kind of low latency requirement, because we really want to like minimize the different round trips and network round trips, which are happening in the hot path of the query. And this is super important because kind of over time, as you build up more and more of these network round trips, um, these start actually accumulating uh, and just adding kind of constant latency to every query, which is going to be hard to get rid of. And yeah, so we turned high rise into kind of this stateless optimizer, right? You also don't wanna have like the single node schema from the original high rise in there, but rather tie this into your metadata service. And then we build tons of different like rule-based optimizations into it. So for example, aggregation push down, view insertion, things like common subtree elimination. And high rise also has, which is very nice, basic cost-based optimizations like join reordering, which we worked on quite a bit. However, here for these cost-based things, really what we're seeing is that in a sense, the hardest thing for us is to collect solid statistics for the optimizer, right? And then kind of feed them back in an efficient way into the planner. So at the moment we are doing things like cost-based join order optimizations, but our estimations here could actually be a lot better. And this is also going to be a big focus for like the upcoming year. Uh, to work on that to get better cardinality estimates and so on. I kind of like to ask a question. Of course. Um, in contrast um, with another competitor like Snowflake, one of the strengths they, they say is because when you have a database, you do ingestion, you actually have really good knowledge about what data you just ingest. Yes. So I want to understand what's the challenge since you are handling the ingestion. So why are the statistics not just super correct just based on how you watch the ingestion? Definitely. So in general, yes, kind of, this is a very nice, uh, or a nice setting to build like a statistics engine into your optimizer, right? At ingestion time, you're kind of building these files, writing them to S3, and you've, in a sense, since you're like sorting aggressively, partitioning and so on, compressing, have touched all the data anyways. However, the thing is, and the most important thing is that you have to keep these statistics like consistent, right? You can't say, okay, I want to run a statistics refresh, go over all your S3 and kind of do sampling there. It's just going to take like, insane amounts of CPU resources and also like just be very slow. So the kind of hard thing here is keeping all your statistics consistent in interfacing with your metadata layer and then making them quickly available to your optimizer. Because if you're touching like say thousands of files lying on S3 and have to collect statistics from all of them in the hot path of your query execution, um, that's actually quite a bit of an engineering challenge. Does Thank that you. answer the question? Yeah, thank you. Perfect, good. So the next thing I wanna talk about at the engine level is actual distributed query processing. And ClickHouse has, as we talked about earlier, distributed execution within its runtime. And this scales well for some types of queries. Examples are distributed aggregations with small result cardinality, 
or something where you can, for example, broadcast intermediate results onto the different nodes in the cluster. However, general purpose data warehousing, and remember, this is also a use case we want to kind of excel at, is full of extremely complex queries, right? Um, aggregations with massive result cardinalities, distributed joins with like large, extremely large tables. And so what we're currently doing at the engine level is actually completely reworking distributed execution. And the idea is to really like build a state of the art distributed execution layer, which takes a query, breaks it down into different stages, which are then scheduled across the cluster. And as the backbone here, we're building a high performance shuffle operator. So for those of you who haven't like thought about distributed processing before, kind of if you want to build a distributed join, for example, you need the shuffle operator. And the shuffle operator ultimately implements a partitioning function across your network. Say you're doing an inner join of two relations on two columns. Then what you want to make sure is that you're able to actually do these joins locally in a sense, so on every node. And you can do this by, for example, hash partitioning in this case on the join columns, shuffling this over the network, then doing local joins, because now the partitioning function is deterministic and the same for both columns. So these like kind of rows you're joining will be on the same node. Then you can do a local join and feed it either to the user as a result or into the next stage, the next shuffle to then, for example, do an aggregation on a different column. And one thing that's interesting about the way we're building like shuffle and distributed processing, which maybe is different uh, from how some others are approaching this pro uh, problem, is that our design is extremely focused on low latency instead of like fault tolerance. So at the moment, and this ties into the things we talked about earlier, we want to really excel at these kind of low latency queries, right? And for this, for example, um, it might become unacceptable to write everything like to S3 as intermediate results within your shuffle stages and read them again, just because you're adding so much latencies on both the reading and writing side. So our like whole design tries to optimize for this. Let's look at an example. Here. Do, do so, you, excuse me. Sure. Do you uh, by any chance ra uh, write intermediate results into the the cache, not this tree. What's the cache in this case? Uh, uh, your cache, where you cache the ranges from okay, S3. So like the local SSDs, for example. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Because like you do have workloads which go beyond main memory, and you have to like be able to support this. Because otherwise, you're not going to be able to scale like to dozens of terabytes. Because even like a very large cluster, in a sense, will okay. It might have like a few terabytes of main memory capacity but not kind of scale to infinity. So you do have to use like your local SSDs for intermediate results or spilling parts of it. Same for aggregations or joins, right? Uh, during the actual execution. Good, so let's give a quick example on distributed query processing. Again, we have our S3 here in the background or at the bottom of the hierarchy with two files, sparse indexes, and in this case, six ranges for each of the files. We then spin up an engine, which in our case has three nodes. So this is not a nice power of two, but it was nicer to visualize. Um, and each of these nodes had to, has its local SSD cache, which again has all these sparse indexes loaded in this, in this case for the files, and also then um, kind of parts of the ranges. So here we have an injective mapping from the kind of backing ranges on S3 onto the different nodes. This means not every range might be loaded into a cache at the moment, but if a range is loaded, it will be loaded onto exactly one node. Now a query comes in. And in this case, we have the following query. We have A, join B. B has a filter on top, which is very selective. And so B is at the right side, which in this case is meant to be the build side. Uh, I know some people put the build on the left. In our case, the build is on the right. Um, and we have these two S1 and S2 in here, which are the shuffle operators. So going back to the thing I talked about, to be able to run this join in a distributed fashion, you have to like put the shuffle before both sides of your join to align the keys and then do a local join. Um, exactly. And in our case, as we said earlier, we actually have our optimizer embedded on the compute node. And for this uh, query here, node one will serve as the primary. This means that in the beginning, we have to actually like schedule kind of the build side uh, of this hash job. So, this means we send out a task to each of the nodes which says, hey, scan the local ranges you have on B, apply the filter, and then feed the rows which pass the filter into your shuffle one. Once this is done, 
all the nodes will report back to node one that, okay, I'm done with this task and we get, can get onto the next one. Note that node one also has an error to itself. This is of course a path you can optimize, but node one also has to take part in query execution, which is why we're visualizing it here. So now we get to the scan on A and feeding into shuffle two. And only once this is done, we can actually start scheduling the local hash join. And here in this case, in the beginning for the first two tasks, we wrote to shuffle, then the shuffle like was implemented and like the partitioning was implemented. So now when we start task three, we can be sure that like the data is shuffled already. We can read from the shuffling service, do the local joins, and then pass the result to the user by either unioning it at the primary or maybe exporting it to S3. And exactly, this is kind of a stack we're completely rebuilding in our engine. Um, and this is actually a like pretty significant engineering effort. Do you do it first come first serve or is there something more sophisticated you're doing in your scheduling tasks? Um, excuse me? I, like, like if you have two queries show up at the same time or like one run after another, is it just first come first serve or are you, are you actually trying to be clever no, so about like? It, tying back into the original thing we talked about, you do have to support concurrent queries, uh, yes. right? Like you, you don't want to run just one query at a time because then you have exactly zero concurrency on your cluster and might right. not be able to nicely saturate your resources. Right, but, but I'm saying like, like if you have to say, I, what task do I send out next? Do you give priority to the query that showed up first or like, are you looking ahead and say, I know these tasks are gonna be paralyzable versus, versus single node and, and then do some, some scheduling that way? Right. Um, so there's a few things we're trying to do here. So first off, we're actually trying to like nicely isolate resources across queries. So we, for example, have like a memory manager, um, which we built, which tries to kind of make sure that like the uh, all queries have enough memory and that not one query can like starve others. Um, and then we're trying on the like CPU allocation to also be like as fair as possible. Um, so usually like fair is a decent heuristic in this case, uh, because say you're like running customer dashboards, then usually like the dashboarding queries will actually be pretty similar. So this is like a reasonable metric to implement. All right, thank you. I have a follow-up question. So uh, in the context, for example, for very distributed query, and you have lots of nodes working on many different parts of the query, mm -hmm. if you have a straggler, um, how do you do the restart? And also I want to understand, is it, very much deviated from the original click house execution model. Um, okay. Yeah, that's my question. Right, so maybe let me start with the second question. Um, and yes, this is a huge deviation from click house and like kind of this ties into where we're hard for. Um, it's not about kind of keeping click house as a runtime forever. It is about kind of building on top of that, moving beyond it and like building or kind of sure at the moment, like keeping some of the vectorized operators, but actually like this is kind of completely changing the flow of a query through all parts of the engine. Going back to your first question uh, on how to deal with stragglers, this is actually <laughs> a, a pretty significant question, uh, which is like not super easy to answer. So in a sense, you would actually want to run into a case where you don't have, like the first step to optimize for this is to actually not have as many stragglers, right? So for this, you need good partitioning functions. This is often not so hard with hash partitioning. Sometimes it is if you have heavy skew, um, but it is not so easy for range partitioning, uh, for example, because there again, you need statistics and so on. Um, so getting this right is actually pretty hard. Um, I don't wanna drill super deep into this because I have like one or two more things I wanna show you that I think are interesting, um, but I'll stick around in the Q and A for as long as I have to. Uh, so you can like keep, uh, keep drilling holes into me. I have a two-year-old. We, we got to cut off at some point. So keep going. Okay, perfect. Uh, okay, Andy, how time. much more time do I actually have? Because you said 45 minutes, but we spend also some time on questions. So I can either wrap it up now, or I can like spend like, I think I can do the rest in like four minutes or something. Is that fine? Yeah, well, finish the slides. Yeah, we, we, can go, we can go a little longer. Okay, awesome. Good. So uh, let's move on. Next thing uh, is actually like service layer and orchestration layer. And this is, as I said, huge for a cloud data warehouse because you have tons of services, admin, metadata, billing, security, and so on. And also you have to kind of orchestrate and provision the compute resources in your clusters. Um, so our services are mostly built in Go um, and kind of orchestrated through Kubernetes. 
And currently our engine provisioning happens through Terraform. And we thought in the beginning that this was like a great choice because Terraform is great at actually spinning up instances and kind of loading binaries onto those. However, kind of as we're moving along and maturing, we're seeing that using Terraform really only solves the provisioning part of things. And it doesn't help a lot with orchestration. So if you want to like orchestrate, right, do health checks, kind of do updates, do recovery and so on, um, you have to either use like different open source projects, which you start integrating, uh, try to roll your own on top of Terraform. And what kind of would be a lot nicer in this case is to actually use the mature Kubernetes infrastructure, which helps you solve a lot of these problems. So this is a lesson learned for us. Um, and at the moment, we're actually moving all of our engine provisioning over to Kubernetes, which will allow for things like better scaling, better recovery, better updates, right? When you're kind of deploying new versions and also through things, things like service meshes, uh, better telemetry. Final thing I want to talk about very quickly, uh, then we'll wrap it up, is the ecosystem side of things. And the only thing I really want to stress here is just how huge the ecosystem has become. And so here we can just see just some players in the ecosystem and how they would integrate with your cloud. All of these at the moment, they are on the roadmap um, and we hope to get there soon. Uh, but just FYI, this doesn't like uh, represent the whole ecosystem we support. You have like tons of stuff on ETL, ELT and streaming, right? Fivetran, Rivery, Kafka. Then you have things doing actual transformation on your database. So DBT or formerly Fishtown is the perfect example for this. And then you have tons of different tools consuming your data in different ways. So BI and visualization tools like Looker and Tableau, data science tools like Python in general, or like you want to query through Jupyter Notebooks, which is big, of course, for ML workloads. Um, and you need to support all of this, either by building your own connectors or by like, building partnerships with these companies to build connectors for you. And here as well, being close to PostgreSQL is pretty nice um, because it makes kind of either for yourself or for the companies or in the ecosystem a lot easier to build connectors. Good. So this wraps up the talk. Um, kind of, I want to go back, um, spend two more minutes just going over what we talked about and the lessons learned along the way. So we first talked about decoupled storage and compute. And here, really, the lesson learned for us is that maybe in the first step, if you're building a cloud data warehouse, even more important than like getting query performance and engine performance right is actually getting like your storage and indexing layer right. Because keeping data close to your compute, building proper buffer managers, and just indexing aggressively is the most important thing you can do to get these low latency queries right. Then we talked about metadata. Uh, and I'm sure there will be a few more questions later on. And um, here really the lesson learned is that uh, if you want to build this right, think about all the different use cases you want to support. Think about multi-tenancy, think about kind of all the different types of data you will store and try to design a service which will be extensible uh, to support this over time. We then talked about the query engine. Here we A said, okay, you kind of need to build a high performance distributed runtime, which is able to scale to in a sense arbitrary algebra trees. And you really want to have your own custom high performance optimizer and planner uh, in order to be able to like deal with arbitrary and also auto generated queries. Finally, we talked about the service layer. And here, maybe a lesson learned is that actually building kind of a like uh, really state of the art kind of microservice layer here, which is run on Kubernetes, is actually quite a nice fit. So, of course, the actual engines doing compute will be quite monolithic. Like this is inherent, I think, to just a lot of database systems and it's not a bad thing, right? But for this like service layer, actually going into like a microservice direction is pretty nice in our opinion. So this concludes the talk. Uh, I, I'm sure there will be some questions now. Thank you so much for joining in. Um, we are hiring. So either go to our website or ping, write me an email if you want to learn more. Thank you. Okay. Edgeman, awesome. Thank you for doing this. I uh, will applaud uh, on behalf of everyone else. Uh, so we have uh, almost 10 minutes for questions. Um, so Chris Chris has a question in chat. Do you want to mute yourself and go for it? Yeah, well, uh, thanks, Edgeman, for talking. Uh, this is Chris from Databricks. I was curious, what's the typical service front end latency? Right. Um, so actually, because I'm not like super heavily involved in that part, I cannot give you a super precise answer. However, like I can say that we are able to like execute queries and like, which obviously don't touch insane amount of data in the order of like a few dozen milliseconds. 
Um, and like this goes through both the service layer and then like the meta service, metadata layer and then like the engine layer. So overall, like at the moment, um, our latency like here in all parts, we're trying to keep low. And of course, with everything we're building, kind of this is a thing where we're keeping in mind our testing and yeah. Cool, thanks again. Sure. Uh, maybe one more thing, actually. I want to give a huge shout out here on the ClickHouse side to Robert from Altinity, who previously like gave a talk, I think in the seminar series. Um, so if any one of you kind of want to know more about that system, um, go in and, and, and watch this great talk. I, I posted the link in the chat. Perfect. OK. All right. Uh, I yeah, I got a question. Can I go? Yeah, go, go for it, OK. So, uh, you replace the storage engine, you replace the runtime, uh, you replace the optimizer. So what percentage of your system is really the original ClickHouse? Right, I mean, what what's the metric here? Like how do you quantify a percentage? I don't know, lines of code. <laughs> okay, I mean, lines of code, I actually think is not a great metric for this uh, because there okay. are like some things uh, which are just like, very hard to build in a sense. And these are the things we're trying to replace first, right? Um, so this is things like the distributed runtime or the optimizer. I would say um, at the moment, like in the actual like vectorized runtimes, the operator, for example, many of these are still pretty close to ClickHouse, but we are changing implementations for the joins, for example. And then I think kind of, especially in 2022, as we're ramping up the teams and so on, less and less uh, will actually like look like ClickHouse or look like high rise, right? And at the moment, for example, I can tell you, our optimizer, uh, kind of which we originally forked of high rise, most of the code is actually from us. So, like, kind of, if you look at the optimizer now, you you don't necessarily actually recognize large parts of high rise anymore. So, so have you done any performance comparison with the ClickHouse? Um, so, I would like to actually not get like deep into benchmarks because I think that's like such a hot topic right now. And there's like so much controversy about these things. So ClickHouse is amazing not, and high performance he's engine. He's not on Twitter. He doesn't know. <laughs> yeah, Habib, there, there's a there's a there's a fight between Snowflake and Databricks right now. Enough blood's been shed. We don't we don't need to get into the, the benchmarks right now. Okay. <laughs> okay. I have a question from uh, Elimai. Uh, is he still here? Yes, I can ask him to mute. Otherwise, I'll, I'll just read it. He asked, uh, what kind of query optimization, optimization do you do when you have more than 50 relations in your query? Right, so great questions. Um, our, so first off, like just the general rule-based optimizations, right? Kind of filter push down, aggregation push down, all these things like free view insertion. Um, and then the join order optimizer at the moment, and this like is largely, uh, kind of actually was built by uh, Moritz Eisen at High Rise, I think. Um, so this comes from them. It's actually like a bottom-up DP, DPCPP algorithm. Um, and like over time, we'll like look to replace this with, I mean, there's obviously like fancy, uh, fancy papers there, for example, by the Munich group uh, on how to make the optimizer scale nicely, even in these bottom-up uh, DP worlds uh, for large amounts of relations. At the moment, our production queries don't tend to have like an insane amount of joins. So this is actually like not our most pressing problem in a sense to like build a super fast join optimizer for, I don't know, 50 relations, hundred relations and so on. Wait, out of curiosity, someone who sees these real-time analytical workloads, I mean, we could ask the Rockset guys, we could ask the Jura guys as well. Like what is the typical number of relations do you see in a single joint, right. like a I mean, single query? Just it's a long tail, I understand, but like, like, Right, uh, I mean, this is a very interesting question. I would say like most queries do have a few joins in them. So like four, five, like something between two and five, like sure there's queries which just go over kind of big tables doing massive scans, but you do see joins frequently, but kind of on the tail end, like you don't actually at the moment see like tons of huge queries, but I do wanna be upfront here and also say, um, there's of course kind of some like actually like bias in the telemetry you get because you get telemetry on the things you're actually like very good at, right? And so I talked about it earlier, kind of distributed joins is something we're like heavily investing in right now, but we're not where Snowflake is, for example, right now, they are where Databricks is. And so uh, I would assume that in their workload data, um, they actually see larger join queries. Okay. All right, cool. 
Uh, any other questions? All right, so my, my last question would be sort of like going back to this optimizer thing. I understand you, you, know, you ripped it out of high rise and worked with that. Um, but at the time, did you consider, I mean, the ClickHouse optimizer is, is I think at least as of last year, was very primitive, right? It was sort of rule-based. Um, so I understand why I want to get something different, but it didn't seem that the high-rise one would be that much more sophisticated than um, than what ClickHouse already had. Uh, and again, I, they may have fixed it or worked on it last year. I, I don't know. I haven't looked at it. Um, but did you consider other options? I mean, pulling out the Postgres one is not really easy. But like, there's there's Orca certainly from the Green Plum guys. There's Calcite, which a lot of you are using. Right. Did you consider so, these other options? Great, great question. So there's there's a few data points here I have for you. First off, uh, kind of the choice for high rise was that it's actually like uh, just neatly built parser and optimizer, which you can like turn into an embedded library and then extend. Right. It was not about like choosing an optimizer, which will serve us forever. It was about choosing an optimizer, which we can actually build up, up on and kind of turn into our own. And for this, high rise was actually a great choice. And then kind of on the alternatives considered side, um, so call side is a good example, for example, but A, we wanted to be a C++ shop. We didn't want to have like two, I mean, CalSight is built in Java, right? And runs on the JVM. Um, we didn't want to have two languages on the actual like high performance database side. Um, and this would also then like you ha would have to split our processes, right? Our way of embedding the optimizer would actually be very hard. And this for us is like super important for low latency stuff. So really this only leaves kind of C slash C++ optimizers. Um, and there, another option maybe nowadays would be DuckDB, um, which is a great system. Uh, three years ago, it wasn't as mature as it is now. Like the DuckDB folks did an amazing job kind of maturing that system over the past years. So that's why back then we actually decided to, to go with high rise. All right, last okay. question from, from Sandeep. Oh. Hey. Right, sorry, Hamid. Hamid. Let, 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 no, no, that's okay. Go ahead. I, okay. Let the deep go and then we'll finish up. Sorry, I, I got to help with dinner. Yeah, I have this quick question. So what is your biggest differentiator compared to Snowflake? How are you able to achieve much better latency and concurrency? Okay, so because it, first off, I and not, not just not just, not just Snowflake, I think BigQuery as well. I think that's another one to consider. Right. So first off, like I don't want to compare us hugely like to the competition in terms of performance numbers. Again, uh, we like this is a hot, hot ground to treat at the moment. I mean, I think, I hope at least that kind of from my talk, I, I was able to like convey what types of workloads we're optimizing for, right? And like, these are very different workloads from these traditional internal like batch BI types of workloads. And so that's what we're trying to excel at um, at the moment. And this is like how we're trying to be different in a sense. I mean, I guess the answer is your competitor, you see your competitor is not the red, the red shifts, snowflakes of the world. It's it's the rock sets, it's the, the druids, right? Materialized in some ways. But I, I would actually like uh, partly dis or like disagree with that. We do want to build yeah. like, we do want to build a cloud data warehouse, right? Like okay. we want to build a full fledged cloud data warehouse, which is able to like process super complex drawings, super complex aggregations and so on. But if we also want to excel, at these like kind of low latency customer facing experiences.